Hi everyone. In this video, I want to talk about something that I learnt today at a AWS convention. Basically, if you've been working in IT for a while and you've pretty much had your ears looking out for the newest ways of doing things, you'd have heard of the term microservices. Now, that was a heavy topic at the, the conference that I went to today. And the main issue I've had with microservices in the past, even ones I've worked with is, you know, persistent storage. And what I mean by that is that if we're going to work across multiple uh, service layers, how do we guarantee that we can have consistency with transactions? And basically, this is one of the things that AWS solved for me today, which was a good thing. So I thought I'd explain it to you guys just to give you an understanding of what they came up with. So my example for this one is similar to the one that they already had because uh, I couldn't fully remember the one that they had on the screen, but it was basically an order processing um, system. So for example, we have an order here, you know, and the order has a payment, like it basically has your credit card information on it and all that other stuff, you know, that you need in order to, to buy something on a on an online store or something like that. And their first recommendation was that no matter what you should do, you should always secure any call you make into AWS through an API gateway. So you can basically lock down, you know, uh, things like denial of service attacks and even work through authentication and that kind of stuff. Um, that's their main recommendation that you start off with a gateway there. So you can create your rest pass, you can define what the um, input and output's going to be so that people can generate SDKs and all that kind of stuff just to make things easy for you. And then the next thing they say is what the gateway should do is it then should translate whatever the request is coming in. So in this case, this is a purchase or this is an order that we're trying to make into what is referred to as a Lambda function. Now, what a Lambda function is in AWS, if you don't know what it is, it's essentially a serverless, it's basically a method um, or an event that can be called uh, by anything. And it's referred to as serverless because there's no actual server that it resides on. It's not stored in an, in an EC2 instance or anything like that, or at least that's not what they show us. But basically it executes on its own you know, just as like you're running a function on your machine, it does its job and then it, it goes to sleep. You know, so it's like executing a console program. You, you you run your console program, you do a job and then it goes to sleep and dies. And you know, next time you need to do it, you, you start it up again. It's like that. And the thing with Lambda functions is it also, um, it scales as well. So, just say you have 1,000 calls coming into the API gateway that calls this Lambda function, there'll be 8,000, uh, there'll be 1,000 instances of that Lambda ex function running, but it's only temporary, you know, and then once the execution has happened, it goes and it dies. So that's kind of how they've defined how they want to do most of their work in um, the future with this service architecture and this microservice architecture is to go with these, the concept of everything executing in a Lambda function. Then what they suggest, for every, and this is a microservice specific um, ideal, is that anything you need to store, rather than centralizing it into one central database and having issues like schema updates, um, consistency you know, locking, all these kinds of problems, is they recommend that these days you look into using a NoSQL database or in the case of uh, AWS, it's a DynamoDB. And that was the example that they gave. So just to reiterate what this is, an order comes in to an API gateway that's, that's secure. It translates the information to a Lambda call that needs to be made. The Lambda call it's fires up does its business rules, its instructions, and stores the information that it needs to inside of a, a DynamoDB. Now, this is the most uh, fundamental entry-level uh, microservice 
that they showed. They did show other ones to do with sending out SMSs and emails and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, this is the bare bone of what you would have. However, this is just one microservice. So this is one call to an API gateway to, to a Lambda, to a DynamoDB. Now for the ordering process, what this is actually doing is this microservice is responsible for just saving an order, okay? So this microservice, so you come up to this service, you go save an order and you pass me the order itself with payments, the whole lot. This here doesn't actually perform the payment though. This is only saving the order prior to payment. So what needs to happen is we need to obviously pay and we need to update product counts and all these other things, right? So this is where microservice architecture comes into play. At this stage, this just looks like a straight up API call. However, what, the, what AWS does is it actually has a bunch of triggers in DynamoDB which can actually trigger more Lambda functions. So, if, so you can come in here and you can say, I want to trigger another Lambda function, right? And it too has a persistent storage. Right, so another DynamoDB here, right? And what this one is, is this is actually managing the payments. So this is the make a payment microservice, right? So this will process the credit card and it will get a response back from the payment gateway and that's and then save that payment details into the payment database, right? So that's the second part of this particular order, right? But at the same time, what can actually also happen is we can call another, because you can use another trigger to hit another Lambda expression, a uh, Lambda function, sorry, uh, that will then go and hit another, or do some more processing and hit another database. And in this case, this one could be as simple as updating the stock count for products, All right? So, and that's one transaction. So you've got three Lambda functions out there that form three separate tasks, you know, that equate to one transaction. Now, you might say, but what if one of these three fail? You know, if one of them fails, it's not really a transaction, is it? Because you've got two in a consistent state and one that isn't. And so how they went about doing this, and just before I do that, I'll put products. Sorry, I should put it that there. Uh, what, how they went about doing this was if you get an error in inside of any Lambda expression based on a business rule or anything like that, what they did is they actually had a third or sorry, a fourth DynoDB that, well, I'm sorry, if anything was to happen inside of any of these Lambdas, then basically information be pushed up into that. Now I forgot the I forgot the pointers for that for basically transferring that information up. But basically an error gets registered inside this errors DB. Right? If any of these fail. I forgot the arrows, sorry about that. Uh, if any of these three fail, it, there's an error thing put in here. Right? Now, you're probably asking, well, what goes in the error, in this error database? Well, it's the concept of this thing called a correlation ID, along with, well, it's, it, essentially it's a correlation ID along with maybe the order number or something. But this correlation ID actually from start to finish, so between every Lambda expression and every DynamoDB, ah, uh, sorry. This actually gets passed everywhere. And this is by default in AWS. So this information, I think that's all of them there. So because you have this concept of correlation ID, they can be stored in all these databases along with the payment. So 
just say for example here we're making a payment you would store the payment information as, as well as the correlation id for the orders you would store the order information as well as the correlation id uh and for the product you would also you know create a product transaction with the correlation id for example all right now what happens if one of these fails well you know the correlation id right so the correlation id then gets added to this error dynamo db and as a result of that what happens is that that triggers calls back to all three well actually no sorry there's actually another lambda expression which i forgot to push out here which is the uh it's referred to as a transaction manager so transaction manager all right Uh, th that's this lambda function so this then gets pushed so basically the information from here gets pushed into this lambda uh, it's not going to string for me <laughs> you jerk so that gets pushed into there alright so once it knows that the correlation ID then gets pushed uh, down into this transaction manager, uh, manager. Transaction manager then goes, okay, what do I need to roll back? Well, I know, you know, this has happened, this has happened, and maybe this one failed, so therefore I need to roll back these two, right? Because it just, yeah, because the information in this error probably has the correlation ID and maybe the function would fail, right? So tra transaction manager goes, okay, well, he's the ones that, that failed, is I'll roll back the ones that succeeded. So then it goes along and, you know, comes in and goes back to the Lambda section to do with each one. Ah, I really messed this up. Um, so it'll go back, but basically what it does is it goes back to each Lambda calls a roll a rollback uh, function on each one of these, and that pretty much cancels the transaction out. That's essentially what we're trying, what it's trying to do here, um, and that's how they went about handling transactions um, using nothing but these lambda functions and S three L these are uh, Dynamo DBs, so. That's pretty much it, what they showed. Um, Jesus. Making a mess. Anyway, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna draw, draw anymore, but you can kind of understand where I'm getting at. But yeah, that's how they did it. And I was, I actually found that really interesting. Uh, I think they had another circumstance for if one of them crashes, what do they do? But this is more to do with if one of them failed business rules or couldn't save it to the database or something like that then basically they could roll back and say, look, you couldn't do it, you know, that kind of thing. And this concept of a correlation ID is kind of like a, a tracker, and the tracker is then, you know, sent to the transaction manager, which knows what to do in terms of rolling back what kind of uh, stuff, and then calls each lender expression to roll back. So, yeah, I hope this is informative. I'm sorry about maybe my explanation wasn't the best, and obviously my diagram wasn't the best. Uh, but I hope you got an understanding of what I was trying to do here. Yeah, but it was definitely a good learning curve for me, and I hope to um, implement something like this soon in an application, especially in a mobile application that I'm going to be working on. Uh, I probably will be using AWS. I was still just indecisive about whether I was going to use Azure or AWS, but I think... Azure at the moment still in preview mode on the serverless architecture, so I think AWS is kind of ahead of them on that on that frame. So I think I will go with AWS in my my mobile app. But yeah, for anyone who was interested and thought this might be insightful, well, here you go. So let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.